Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to start today with a simple premise. The world is changing very rapidly. And social change today operates in a landscape that's radically different from the one in which many of our practices, principles, and systems uh, were, were, were first developed. And we all know many of the different forces and trends that are changing the world around us. These are things like emerging technologies, continuing economic uncertainty, uh, shifting demographics that are changing the faces of our communities, divisions and fragmentation uh, in our communities and in the world around us, uh, growing numbers of environmental challenges, uh, and um, very relevantly for this conference, blurring sectoral boundaries. These are all things that are familiar to most of us, uh, but they're coming together in really interesting ways, and any one of them can actually change a community or issue on its own. Altogether, they're fundamentally transforming local and global landscapes around the world. Now, they come together, like I said, in, in a number of different ways, and I could talk probably for all of my time about some of the different ways that, 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 that are changing the field. Uh, but let me talk about just a few in the time that I have. So I'll start with new ways of creating social impact. It used to be that a donor could give to their community foundation, their university, a museum, uh, the symphony. Uh, today, there are many more options. Donors can give uh, locally, they can give nationally, they can give globally, they can give through a community foundation, they can give directly to nonprofits, they can give through online giving platforms. There are more choices than ever before. And we're seeing more and more people figure out that they can affect social change and create social change in a number of different ways. So, for example, it's not just giving to charitable organizations anymore. The growth of super PACs and PACs uh, in the wake of Citizens United, we've seen the giving to political causes as a way to create social change uh, skyrocket, and we expect that to grow even more in the 2016 elections. We've also seen the rapid growth of sustainable and responsible investing, uh, and that's been a steady growth uh, even through the economic downturn. And then we're, we're also uh, seeing people trying to create change through their purchasing decisions. Uh, so how can their behavior as consumers change the world? And so we're seeing more and more people believe that their buying decisions can have an impact on the world around them. Another of the big changes we're seeing is around opportunities to use big data. Uh, I read recently that 90% of all the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. And what we're seeing is that trend is continuing to grow as there are more and more embedded devices and chips. Uh, so my refrigerator can tell me how often it's been opened. My mother's pill bottle can tell me whether she's taken her medicine that day or not. And imagine what that means for social change when we can get access to all of that information about the services people are using, the things they need, public opinion, without having to reach out and do it directly all the time. Uh, another of the big trends we've been looking at at the Monitor Institute are the growing divisions and the fragmentation in our communities. Right? So that can come in a number of different ways. It, it can be racial and ethnic division. This is a map of Detroit, uh, and you can see how fragmented the po and segmented the population has become. The divisions actually are also coming across class lines, and these days, uh, 70% of the children born in the lowest income brackets end up staying in the lowest income brackets. Uh, and social mobility for poor people in the US is amongst the lowest of all Western nations. Uh, and we're also, of course, we all know about the political polarization that we're seeing these days, uh, which is really freezing up the, our public problems, our systems for public problem solving, and really changing in both what can be done by government, but also creating new opportunities for social change organizations to have an impact and create dialogue in ways that didn't happen before. Another of the big trends is around in the environment. So many organizations don't think about the environment when they're doing their work, but we often like to talk about it because more so than almost any other issue that you can imagine, uh, environmental issues can completely trump a community's or, a, or, or an organization's agenda. 
So you can Im imagine how a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake in a place can really fundamentally change uh, the agendas. So take, for example, this map of what North America would look like if all the ice caps melted. You can imagine that the community agenda in Charleston is going to be a little different if the city's underwater, right? We're, and it's not just the coasts that are going to be affected by these environmental issues. We've seen a, a sevenfold change since the 70s in the number of large natural disasters. And so it's quite likely that almost a, every community you see will face some sort of natural disaster in the coming years. With all of this change, it's hard to know what to do. I often look to the words of Peter Drucker, who said, the greatest, turbulent, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself. It's to act with yesterday's logic. And so we've done a lot of thinking at the Monitor Institute about what it means to try and create what we call next practices, not just the best practices of today, but in fact the emerging approaches that will be a good fit for the way the world is changing around us. Uh, the problem, though, of course, is how do you come up with a next practice? How do you know what's coming? And so we've begun to work on, on an approach we call finding and flipping orthodoxies. And to start us off here uh, uh, and explain what that means, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. And like many great social change stories, it starts with a picture of a big, giant gun. <laughs> now. It, 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 you laugh, but at the same time, there's actually a lot we can learn from military folklore and the history of artillery. You all know what I mean by artillery, right? So these are the big, giant guns that would get drawn to the edge of the battlefield by teams of horses back before World War I. Uh, later on, as they got bigger, by big, giant trucks. Uh, and then they would be used to shell the enemy from a distance. Well, it seems that sometime after World War II, the British and American militaries were uh, holding a joint artillery exercise, and they found a very funny thing. The British fired more slowly every time. So they were trying to figure out what happened. They asked the American team, you know, what do you think is going on? The Americans, of course, said what Americans typically say, we're better. Uh, and they, but they watched the, the, the videos of how the teams would fire, because it's a large team of people firing, and they found a very funny thing. Right before the cannon would go off, uh, several of the team members would step back from the gun, pause, the gun would fire, and then they would rejoin their teams, reload again, and then right before it fired again, they would step back again. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. They asked the soldiers, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? They said, it's how we were trained to do it. So they went to every expert they could find, and they finally found an old veteran from before the Boer War. And he watched the video, and he said, I know what they're doing. They're holding the horses. Because, of course, you see back before World War I, if when the cannons went off, the boom would spook the horses and they would bolt unless someone actually stepped back and held on to them. Uh, but the interesting thing was that many, many years after horses were long removed from the process, people were still stepping back and holding the horses. And so the question we're talking about now is, how can you make sure that your organizations and the organizations that you work with don't end up holding the horses? Uh, and we call these sorts of holdovers orthodoxies. These are deeply held beliefs about how things are done that may or may not still be true, but that often go unstated and unchallenged over time. Uh, every organization, every industry has them. Uh, grocery stores, for example. You all know about ex the express lane at, at your grocery store. But if you stop to think about it, they're giving their very best service to their very worst customers. Uh, and what would it look like if you actually flipped that orthodoxy on its head and gave your best service to your best customers, the mother with three crying children buying $500 worth of groceries? We've also seen lots of orthodoxy flips in the banking industry as well, right? So we've seen, it used to be that you would get money at the bank and do your banking at the bank. That's been completely flipped on its head with the ATM, right? Now you do your banking at the ATM and that's become the orthodoxy. And that's now getting flipped on its head as we can take pictures of our checks and send them in from wherever we are and mobile banking takes over. And of course, many of you know about in, how in the airline industry, the Southwest Airlines flipped almost every orthodoxy in the book. 
the idea of assigned seating, the idea of first class, the idea that you had to fly through hubs, the idea that you need different types of airplanes, the idea that flying couldn't be fun. Uh, they, they haven't necessarily been wholly perfect on, on, that, on flipping that last one. Uh, but so the interesting thing, though, is social change has more than its share of orthodoxies, too. Right? This conference, almost by definition, is flipping the orthodoxy that social organizations can't make a profit. But there are many others, almost too many to name. So the idea that risk taking should be minimized. Uh, the idea that overhead costs should always be kept to a minimum. Uh, all of these things are default assumptions that organizations working in the social space take for granted and often don't think to challenge. Uh, so, and what we've found is it's very hard to take these things on because they're often unstated and they go unseen and we don't talk about them, we just do them by default. Uh, so, but we believe that in, in a fundamental way, social change or organizations, if they continue to just simply do business as usual, they're going to miss out on opportunities for creating real value and, and new ways of working. Uh, so how do you flip an orthodoxy? I'll tell you very quickly. Uh, what you do is you start off by actually being deliberate about it. Sit down with some of your colleagues and think about and brainstorm all the different orthodoxies that you can find. Simply naming those orthodoxies is a powerful thing in itself. Next, for each of them, think about should this be flipped? Many orthodoxies are actually good things and help you work, but many no longer fit. And so stop to think about whether it still should be flipped, either partially or completely. Third. Ask whether there are others in the field, other times, places, or spaces, other industries who flip that orthodoxy. That can give you hints at what it might look like to try and, try and do it where you work. And finally, think about what your organization would look like if you flip that or orthodoxy. And what difference would it make in your organization? Why would it matter? Uh, all of this is really about trying to get intentional about seeing the orthodoxies of your work and questioning and challenging whether they still belong. And being intentional and deliberate in this way when you think about orthodoxies is how you make sure you don't end up holding the horses in the years to come. Thank you. <laughs>